everyone. Uh, my name is Lydia and uh, I'll be telling a tale about uh, artificial intelligence in hospitals tonight. It's a, yeah, it's a neat topic. You can do a lot in healthcare with, with artificial intelligence. I uh, put down a couple of examples here. Uh, the first one is to predict complications. Uh, you can imagine that if somebody is in the, uh, in the intensive care, if you were to be able to predict when, yeah, what is going to happen, you can anticipate on that faster, and uh, it could prevent all sorts of problems. Also targeted treatment, uh, personalized medicine, it's kind of like a buzzword these days, and it, basically what it means is that instead of having a normal protocol, you could have very tailored uh, treatment suggestions which are very specific to your own case. Uh, assistance with diagnosis. It is uh, a fact that when you have a rare disease, it often takes uh, about two years before you get the correct diagnosis. And if it takes two years be before you get a diagnosis, you're, yeah, you're pretty screwed. It feels really bad. Yeah? I think you got the point by now that it sucks if it takes two years before uh, you get your diagnosis. I'm going to move on to the next one, which is automatic image analysis. Uh, this is not so much that uh, computers can do it better, they can maybe do it cheaper. Uh, yeah, if you guide it, and um, money is important in healthcare because we actually want to spend it on people and not on yeah, tagging things in images and all that. Still, there is a, it's a fact that in the Netherlands, uh, AI is not being used that much in hospitals in practice. Um, and there are multiple reasons for that, but one of those reasons is the one I would like to talk to you about tonight, and I call it the data gap. And what I mean by that, um, uh, in general, AI, what happens is uh, you show a bunch of examples to a model, you tweak the internal parameters of the model and um, until you have the desired outcomes. And then once you have that model and it has been trained, uh, you put it in practice, show it like a real life case and then you'll get some useful information out, out of the model. Uh, so in the hospital case, that would mean if I want to do research, uh, I go to a hospital, I ask if I can maybe have some data, they'll put together a very nice data set, which is anonymous and everything, and you can take it home, uh, train a system on it, and then when it's done, you would like to take it to the hospital and put it in practice. However, uh, the data, the way you had received it from the hospital, the data set, is not available inside the hospital real time uh, as you would expect. And if you have different data or incomplete data or it's not in the right form that you would expect, yeah, you put in different data and you get bad outcomes. So, uh, yeah, this really, yeah, this really makes it difficult for small companies or, yeah, research projects to actually make their way into practice. And then you might think, but we do have electronic healthcare records. So all the data that you have, it should be available. And it's true. However, uh, yeah, the electronic healthcare records, they consist of a lot of different things. Uh, yeah, here it says images, measurements, medication. These things are very structured, so they are present the way that you would expect them in your data set. But there are also a lot of things like notes from meetings, letters that come from other hospitals or that uh, are sent to doctors. Uh, and these are in natural language. Uh, information can be scattered across different sources. Uh, for instance, like just a list of symptoms that somebody has, that is, that is not at all readily available in your dossier. Uh, yeah, so the root of the problem, what causes this, is first of all that it's stored in different places. Uh, a lot of text is involved. Yeah, and natural language, you first need to process it before yeah, you can use any of the information that's in there. Uh, yeah, thirdly, structured data is not really structured. What I mean by that is, uh, when you work with computers and something is supposed to be structured, then what you would expect that if two fields have yeah, 
say the same thing, you expect them to actually be the same. If two things say something else, you expect them to actually be different things. Neither of these things, these things are necessarily the case, uh, because people just fill out a form. Uh, they can use different synonyms, so it'll say something different. Yeah, but it's, it's actually really the same. And uh, yeah, the reverse also happens. Also, uh, yeah, no data models of their own information systems. The, behind this electronic healthcare record, there's a huge database. Uh, stuff is stored everywhere. And uh, they buy these systems from some distributor. There are a couple of them in the Netherlands. But once these systems are implemented, what they do not do is provide the hospital with the information. All oh, right, when I type this in, it is stored in that table. When I type this in here in the system, it's stored in that table. They have to go figure that out themselves at the back end. And finally, yeah, doctors have bad handwriting. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't actually mean like this because this is handwritten, and obviously we do have. Um, yeah, it's all just typed. But making up your own homemade abbreviations, I call that bad handwriting. Um, yeah, the use of punctuation. I really wish they would do it more. And uh, yeah, in general, it's more of a note to self style in which they write. I have like two very. I've picked two small details that'll, uh, yeah, maybe demonstrate that a bit. This is a TNM code. It's a code, you find it only in natural, yeah, mainly in natural language, and it describes some properties of a tumor. Well, this looks pretty simple, right? It should be easy to detect. Then we can add a couple of prefixes, suffixes. It's still like all in the same thing, it's okay. Then somebody thinks, okay, but I have a primary tumor and a secondary tumor. So I'm just going to write it down like this instead of write down two codes. Or maybe they were not that sure. It's a CT3 or 4. And then it gets out of hand. More quickly, they separate like the code and they put another measurement in between and uh, some more information. I know, it's one detail example. Here's another one. This is a uh, lung. It's a, a lung test. It consists always of two values, one in liters, one in a percentage. And then, I know, sometimes you write it different, use a bit of different units. This is also fine. Then they do it before and after the medication. So all of a sudden, I have four measurements to detect and extract and understand that it's all still the same measurement. Uh, and then, because you go through the data and then all of a sudden you also find these kind of things. Sorry, it's in Dutch, but a streefwaarde, it's like all of a sudden it's a target value. So you find it, it is exactly the same measure, but now you should ignore it because it's not actually a measurement. It's just something that they hope to reach at some point. And um, this, is, this is basically my nightmare <laughs> because this one still has the four values uh, yeah, two liters, two percentages, but if you look at the last percentage, it's 10%. If you look at the other values, that doesn't really make sense. This is not the actual percentage that uh, we want to extract. This is an improvement. They don't write that down. It's implied, but yeah, this, this stuff is uh, annoying. <laughs> and these are two like very tiny detailed examples, but uh, everything that I work with, like as soon as I start looking through the data, the simple cases are simple and it gets out of hand fast. Okay, right, so how do I know? Uh, I work for uh, CTQ, it's a company, a small company, and um, we provide search in hospitals. That means that uh, we can take the EHR, transform it into uh, a search engine, and then uh, yeah, doctors themselves can find groups of patients. So imagine that you want to find all the patients that will fit a certain clinical trial or uh, you need to do quality management uh, and gather data. Uh, that is what the search engine can be used for. And yeah, I built the natural language processing elements for that and I've looked through a lot, a lot of data for that. So some of the other stuff that we do is, for instance, we detect all the concepts in natural language, uh, diseases, procedures, uh, measurements, all of it. 
And then I try to analyze the context. So there can be a lot of reasons why a, uh, a disease is mentioned. Here we see, for instance, uh, your family history, but it has nothing to do with the patient themselves. Uh, negation, sometimes they're not sure. It's still a differential diagnosis, all these kind of things. And then we would like to know when things happen. Uh, yeah, so that is uh, the reason that I'm giving this talk here today, and uh, I feel like I can uh, tell you about this data again. So, when there's a problem and I complain about bad handwriting, that kind of sounds like I'm blaming the doctors. Uh, because they should just, you know, write things down structured and then all our problems will be over. However, I think it would be wrong to do so. Because, uh, yeah, I think doctors should just take care of their patients. I already feel like when I'm there that they're like typing half the time. And, uh, so they're doctors, not form fillers. And also, when it comes to like filling out forms, um, you have all these people uh, who are, for instance, interested in the quality in hospitals or who are doing their research. And literally everybody can think of one more field to add to get more detailed information or more information. And uh, at some point, yeah, the workload will become just too much for the doctor. And also the fact that even, yeah, even if you would choose to do so, you can you cannot just catch all the information in forms. There always has to be this field, other or remarks or you never get rid of this free text problem. Um, yeah, so. Then there are a couple of possible solutions if you still want to be able to uh, make AI workable more in hospitals. I've listed a few here. And the first thing is to re-enter information. Uh, yeah, it sounds a bit dumb, right? That you open up a screen and then you fill out the information that it needs and then it can help you with whatever that you're doing. Um, I see here it happens a lot. And it's not so much for AI systems, but all these quality registries or yeah, actually like data gathering for medical research, it does happen a lot. Like people are working with one screen and another screen just typing information from one place to, to the other. Yeah, I don't think it's an actual solution. I just wanted to give like more of a starting point of yeah, what's happening right now. Then there are people, uh, like organizations, who focus on registration of the source. And it's basically that they would like to build protocols as to how to write down medical information. And I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a good idea to try and push people to write things down nicely. But I think it's very unlikely that, first of all, that they will be able to agree with all of them on how to write things down. And then also to actually have people do that, I think it's just unlikely that it will ever happen. So then, as we saw in the beginning, if all you have to do is show model examples and, and the desired outcomes and then it'll learn, why wouldn't you learn from the raw messy data? Uh, yeah, IBM Watson, it, the yeah, one with Jeopardy, not like two years ago or whatever it was. Uh, Google, they defeated Go. It's both, uh, they use uh, deep learning for that. So, uh, what would they be able to make from these raw, messy records? I have two examples from them. Abby and Watson, uh, they did a case study, and uh, it was about detecting patients with a risk for cognitive heart failure. Uh, they got a bunch of um, electronic healthcare records, they trained a the system on it, 85% accuracy, they mentioned how important the uh, natural language processing features were. It seems pretty nice. I do think, however, that it's like it's very, you know, it's one very detailed task compared to wanting to, um, yeah, I know, take on a bit more of an ambitious thing. Google did that. They had like a nice uh, paper in Nature in 2016, and they were uh, based on records made. A prediction for all the diseases that they encounter for each patient. So you have like a full, uh, yeah, you have like for every disease that they know of, a probability that you will develop that in the upcoming year. So that's, um, yeah, I do think that is quite ambitious. Um, 
Yeah, they have a, a UC, I'm not going to explain the measure. It should be between 0 0.5 and 1. 1 is perfect, 0 0.5 is at random. 0 0.77, if this is what you're trying to do, predict any and all diseases. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very impressive. So, why then the problem is solved, right? So the downside is you need a lot, a lot of patient dossiers to train your system in such a case. Uh, and in the first case, even to learn just one tiny specific thing, and you would have to do this for every problem that you're trying to tackle. So how many patients do they use? IBM Watson, 300,000 patients. Do you remember I was talking about rare diseases? I think it's going to be hard to find 300,000 patients, uh, patients with a rare disease. It's, and Google, 4.2 million patients. And um, I copied this literally from the paper, and it says de-identified patients. But medical data is sensitive data, and I do think like handing over 4.2 million medical records to Google with uh, the technology, the knowledge, and the incentive to kind of link that to your own normal profiles and things, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> and on top of that, I said uh, that they learned from the raw messy data, but then if you look a bit more into the papers and the strategies that they use, then you find that actually what they do first is they, uh, with all the free text that they encounter, where also the IBM case had said, oh, they were, they were such important features, they also pre-process them, get out the concept, uh, classify the context, surprise, surprise, that's, you know, what I'm, the pipeline that I, uh, that I have built. Like, all these steps, they also still take. So it's not even that they just use the raw plain record, they still need to process it first. Yeah, so then the, the, the final potential solution will be to process raw data into an intermediate EHR. So you have your system and doctors can just type, even though I do hope they will start using punctuation at some point, <laughs> but, but they can just enter the information in a way that is comfortable to them, and then in the back you can just process it, uh, store it kind of again, very structured, very nicely made, such that computers can use that information. Uh, I guess it's not that surprising that this is my favorite solution because this is what I work on. But um, I think the funny thing is that in our company, yeah, we, right now we only do search and uh, this intermediate EHR is almost just a byproduct of that. But uh, I think it would be really, really cool if at some point in the, in the future we can just let people who have built cool stuff plug that in and then, uh, yeah. Then I find it very nice to imagine a medical app store. Like if this data gap would be closed, that you have this place where doctors can uh, get all the tools that yeah that can be helpful to them, and uh, yeah can improve healthcare. Hi, right, that was my talk. Thank you. Very much.